<laughs> Sorry for those who just joined us live. <laughs> These people here are making me laugh. It's great to be with you. It's great to be with those who watch on YouTube and those who are on uh, Facebook and also those live. I appreciate you being here. And uh, this morning I want to continue with the idea of prayer and I'm going to talk about talking or praying dangerous prayers. Last time I spoke about this, I talked about the idea of the so that prayers. We pray something so that this will happen. Um, that's worth checking out from a few weeks ago. But this week I want to talk about praying bold prayer, or the prayer particularly is make me bold. It's quite a dangerous prayer to pray. And the reason I'm doing this now is because over the next few times I speak, to pray the prayers that I've got ahead of us, you're going to have to be bold to pray those prayers. So I'm starting with, make me bold, Lord, because you're going to need it as we progress. I don't know about you, but sometimes our prayers, other people's prayers, prayers around us are often fall to making the, the two mistakes that I pointed out, but our prayers are often too small, or our prayers are often too general. Yet God wants us to be to keep in mind that he's a God who answers prayers, but he's also a God who likes to be challenged by our faith and to see where we can stand and what we can to go to. Now, I admitted a few weeks ago that I'm not the, the greatest prayer. There's some people that are almost professional prayers, and they're amazing. You know, those people can quote the Bible left, right and centre, and it all comes out. And most people... Who, who have those prayer positions, I don't know if you've ever noticed them, they are fascinating. Some people pray with a, a quiet, look like they're sucking lemons. Oh, Jesus. And that kind of intimidates me sometimes, you know, because you just wonder, have I sucking a lemon or is it really a spiritual thing that's going on? Because I'm not like that. And people who, you, you come and go, when, you know, they pray so, so good and they get extra points, uh, especially when we start talking about binding up the devil and, and then other people agree with and go, hmm, yeah, yes, Jesus. And it kind of adds a load of weight to their prayer. But you wonder, what's really going on? Because I read in the Bible that sometimes we need to lock ourselves away. It's not about what you think of my prayers. It's about what he who I'm praying to thinks of my prayers. It's important. And not to be intimidated by other people. <laughs> I've often found times of prayer, especially in prayer meetings, get boring and I'm wondering, is God bored? Because I certainly am, just get to a point. You know, people have prayed for 20 minutes. I don't know if you've ever been around somebody's house and they've prayed to a point where the dinner's gone cold or the salad's got warm. It's kind of like, thank you, Jesus, let's move on and eat. But today I just want to talk about dangerous prayers because following Jesus was never meant to be safe. You do appreciate that, don't you? Come to Jesus, it's going to be brilliant and wonderful and we're going to go to heaven. And then they miss out that little bit. It's like being recruited by army. You know, when you go down to a recruiting office and they tell you all the great things, you're going to travel the world, you're going to get to shoot a gun for the guys, you know, blow up things and it's going to be amazing. Yes, there's a possibility for you, you might get shot and blown up yourself, but they don't tell you that stuff, they just tell you the good things. And becoming a Christian... Often people tell you the good things of becoming a Christian. It's all true. We are washed in the blood. We are clean and sanctified and we've got heaven ahead of us. And Jesus loves us and we've got access to the throne room of God. And these things are all amazing. And God hears our cries and he lifts us up and he loves us. And he, he I'm trying to think of all the spiritual words. He does all that stuff as well. And it's all amazing. But they never really tell you much about it's not really safe to be a Christian in this world. In our country it is, to a point, but in other countries it's not. Yet all that stuff still applies, but make me bold because we're not living in a safe world. And following Jesus was never meant to be safe. Read the, Fox, the Fox's book of Martyrs, it's an interesting book. Or Jesus Freaks is a condensed version of it, which is a really good read about people that's come before us. But I just want to get into the Bible, into Acts 4. Thinking about bold prayers. So in Acts 4, we read this, starting at verse 1. It says, The priests and the captain of God, now I need to put something into context here. In chapter 2, the Holy Spirit fell and Peter's preaching. Thousands of people are coming to Jesus, and it's amazing. And then sometime later, we don't know how long, but it says, uh, Another day, Jesus, uh, sorry, Peter and John are walking through, and there's a guy laid there. 
paralyzed, and they say in the name of Jesus, get up, and he gets up, and it's a great miracle, and everyone's buzzing about it, and while wow, miracles are still happening, in what Jesus is here. So now we're into chapter 4, that's just happened, and he says, the Sadducees came to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. While the, there was a great disturbance because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in, the, in Jesus the resurrection from the dead, which is the gospel they preached, and that's the gospel we should preach. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put him in jail until the next day. So these guys are just preaching away, and now they've been put in jail. And they're not the comfy jails that we often see today, in our country at least. Uh, where were we? Next day, but many who heard their message believed, so that the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. So the church is growing, but Peter and John are in prison. The next day, the rulers and elders of the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. They had Peter and John before them and began to question them, by what power or by what name are you doing these things? It's amazing that the Sadducees, the, the unbelievers, the religious people, understood this power in the name of Jesus, or at least in a name. What name are you doing? They say, and uh, so they question, what power and what name are you doing? This? Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, <laughs> said to the rulers and elders, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, so he's shown respect, but he's been honest with them. If we are being called to an account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame, and by being asked how this was, how he was healed, so that's a guy from the previous chapter, but know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, and this man is standing before you healed. I mean, that's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? That's like walking into the house of Parliament, and they're all pointing their fingers and saying, by what power? And you stand there, look guys, you did this, but God raised them. They're supposed to be on God's side. And he said, no, you killed him, but God raised him up. They didn't want to hear that. This is not the conversation of a nice, sweet thing. We've just been in prison. If you want to be let out, you need to play ball. Peter and John are having none of it. This is, he stands before you, in other words, there's evidence here that God is at work because he's raised him up. That means this is getting quite scary for them. Jesus is the cornerstone you builders rejected. He's even having a go at him again, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. I mean, this is not a nice confrontation. They could get beaten, they could get whipped, they could get put in prison, and they could be killed for what they're saying. And yet Peter and John stand there, and that's what they say. Verse 10 in the New Living Translation, it says, Let me be clear, state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that, it, that, this was, that he was healed by the power, powerful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the man you crucified, but who God raised from the dead. Peter's stating this. Now, you've got to understand the crowd of people. There were Pharisees there and Sadducees. Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. So he's gone straight for that one. And the Pharisees were worried that Rome were going to do something and come in if this disturbance didn't stop. They thought they got rid of Jesus, but now it's got even worse. Because instead of being one Jesus, there's now at least 120 people filled with the Holy Spirit and making a difference. Now you've got to understand that in Acts, Luke is focusing on a few people at a time. But there were hundreds of them doing this and going around, doing all sorts of things. Not just Peter and John. There was the other apostles there, um, this is before Peter and Paul comes along, but if even the disciples were known for go going out and doing it, they're normal disciples, not just the apostles, people like you and me. Then, down to verse 13, it says, The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. I keep reminding boldness because we're going to get on to something, of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. Ordinary men, like you and me. They're not, spe they're not spent six months, six years, 20 years in theological college. They've just been spent time with Jesus and now we're preaching. Now you spend time with Jesus, don't you? The, the proper answer is yes there. 
So you're going on the same journey as these guys. All they did was spend three, three years with Jesus physically. We're spending time with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit inside us, who will never leave us or forsake us. And he's working with us. But the interesting thing, he said, they were a bit amazed at their boldness because they were all ordinary men. The word ordinary men in the Greek is I-D-I-O-T-A-I, idioi, which is where we get the English word idiots from. So they were amazed because these guys were idiots to them. Now, are you an idiot? No, well that should give you some hope now, shouldn't it? Because they were accused of being idiots. We're not idiots. We're at a level up. So we should be a level up beyond them. But they're bold. They were bold because of Jesus and the Holy Spirit filled them. You see, the guy, they, these religious leaders were in a bit of a dilemma. Because the guy who got healed was standing there. And he was about 40 years old. He'd been sick, uh, ill all his life. He's standing there. He's obviously been healed, but they can't let this continue because Rome will come in and do something about it. So they're trying to tramp it down. And we do remember that Jesus did say that things were going to get worse for them. The temple was going to come down and stuff like that. So they're kind of all, all very nervous. So they decided, we can't do much about it, so we'll threaten them. Well, they've already been threatened, but this is, they got told that they're going to be beaten, they'll be put in prison, they could be killed. If they continue to speak in the name of Jesus. It's interesting that over the centuries the church has been told that if you continue to speak in the name of Jesus, we'll threaten you, we'll beat you, we'll imprison you, we'll probably kill you. And there's many people around the world that have stopped, but there's also many people that's continuing to speak out in the name of Jesus. You see, many people don't mind you talking about God, but don't mind you talking about him upstairs and things like that. But when you start talking about Jesus, it makes you get upset. That's why I loved when Donald Trump um, became the president because the guy who prayed for him at his main service actually said, in the name of Jesus. And he'd been told by people, do not mention that. But as a believer and as a person, he cried out, in the name of Jesus. And as a church, we need to keep standing on the name of Jesus. And it continues, this is verse 23 now. It says, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all the things that the chief priests and the elders said to them. And when they heard this, they were raised their voices in prayer to God. Now, they all get back and they did probably what we would do. If you were out witnessing Halifax or Stone Bridge and then the police came along and started threatening you, or councillors, or whoever came along and started threatening you, they came back together and told what had been going on, and they prayed. Now, what sort of prayer would you think they prayed without reading ahead? Often we might pray... You know, Lord, keep us safe. It's not a bad prayer, isn't that, is it? Amy's on the road, keep us safe. <laughs> Don't worry, Amy. Right. Oops, I've been less than this. <laughs> no, our driving's actually quite good, sorry, I shouldn't say that. But keep us safe. How about this? Protect us, Lord. We hear a lot of that in prayer meetings. Give us a comfy life. We might not say that, but that's really what we mean in. Keep us safe, keep us comfy, keep us trouble free. Don't let anything bad happen to us. We might not say them directly, but that's what we're often saying in our prayers. Because when we start praying, especially when we start saying, Lord, help me to be a witness so that people might get saved, hell's getting a bit nervous and opposition starts to come. He says this verse 29. It goes through this whole thing about praying about who God is and stuff, who Jesus is. And they get down to verse 29. Now remember, they've been bold, haven't they? You all agree with that? They've been bold. But then verse 29 says, And now, O oh Lord, hear their threats. And now here comes a real dangerous prayer. And give your servants great boldness in preaching your word. They're already being bold under most circumstances. But now they're saying, mate, give us great boldness. This is going to a new level. And that's with threats. Do that and I'm going to smack you. And they're saying, Lord, hear their threats, but let's do it anyway. Let's go out and make a difference. And we need to pray, make me bold. 
so that we have an unshakable spirit, uh, spiritual conviction in our hearts to get out there and do something. To understand the spiritual urgency of what's happening. This world is not going to carry on the way it is forever. One day Jesus is going to return and the people that we're not reaching out to are going to be left behind when we whip out of here, which is great for us, but not for them. And if we claim to have any compassion of Jesus in our hearts, and if we claim to have the love of God in us, then we'll try to reach out to people to be bold, to step out and to make a difference. Now, a question that I ask myself and I'm going to ask you guys is, how, am how amazed are people at your boldness? Now, generally Christians drop into free camps, especially into the Pentecostal circles. There's, there's a Christian that does a lot of talking but in the church, but never does any talking outside the church. And most people never under understand or see that they are Christians, other than the fact they go to church. There's also the other people which everybody knows they're a Christian, and they tell everybody. And they, but there's a third bracket, which is the, no, the crazy ones, which only really happens in the Pentecostal circles. No, the wacky ones. So I'm not assuming anybody's wacky here. And if you think there's no wacky people in our church, maybe you're the one. Don't look anywhere. Maybe it's me. But the truth is, how amazed are people at your boldness? Now, I don't mean just about witnessing, but you know, just saying to people, look, I'm going to pray for you. Or let me pray for you. You see, I stopped telling people I'm going to pray for them. I started saying, let me pray with you. And I literally grab them. I'm not going to do it later on. Let's do it now. You know, I might be doing something later on. I might be eating. I don't want to interrupt me eating by praying for somebody. I might as well do it now, aren't I? You're all looking at me going, Johnny, you should be spiritual. And I understand that. But really, I, I can't keep in mind everybody's prayer request. So let's just do it now. So how amazed are people at your boldness? Or are you one of these people who it takes five years before you realise you're actually a Christian? So I don't tell people I'm a Christian. I take, tell people I'm a follower of Jesus. Because everybody in this country is technically, to most people, we just think, well, maybe everybody's a Christian. So I say, no, I'm not a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. That kind of upsets people straight away. So that's not normal thing. Let's get back to the Bible. Verse 29, the verse I read earlier. This is the New Living Translation. And now, O oh Lord, hear their threats. So Peter and John and the others are not denying the threats. They're not saying they'll never happen to us. They're not actually saying um, anything other than, Lord, hear their threats. Have you noticed in the Old Testament, there were many people that said, God, they'd, they'd lay letters out or they'd say, you've heard what they've said. Now, Lord, you do. They're not denying anything. They're just being honest. Hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miracles and signs and wonders be done through your name by, the, by your holy servant, Jesus. Isn't that what we're asking for? But it's interesting, we're not asking for the boldness, but we're asking for the miracles. And maybe the boldness is what leads to the miracles. Because you'll never see a miracle if you don't pray for somebody. Just a thought, isn't it? After they had prayed, the meeting, were, the, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they preached the word of God with boldness. I mean, they're having a prayer meeting and the building shakes. I mean, there'd be panic, wouldn't there, in our country if that started happening. Be I've heard stories where the fire services have rolled up at churches because it's been on fire. Fire coming out of the top, and there are churches inside praying. Because it's not literally a fire, there's a spiritual fire that everybody else can see on the roof, and the fire service is ready to put it out, but it's not really there, but it is there because people are praying. They trusted in God, they asked for boldness and expected God to move, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and the place shook, and they went out and preached with boldness. You see, many people said to me, well, you know, Johnny, shouldn't we ask for more of God? Well, why not you use what you have? I need more faith. Well, use what you have. And then, you know, as you run out of that, ask for more. Just keep using whatever is in front of you. Use whatever you've got. But to make us bold means to go out and to do something, to make a difference, to do something different than what you've done before. That might be for some of you that you announce that you're a Christian. When I was in sixth form many, 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 many years ago, many years ago, 
I was only I was a baby Christian, and I thought, you know, it's gonna it's gonna save me a lot of time and hassle if I tell everybody. So I did. Stood up, told everybody to shut up, which was interesting because I didn't say much. But usually when I did, it would kind of, "Is Johnny going to eat me or not?" So I just told, "I'm now become a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm just telling you because I've been told to be a witness." So there you are. Ding. I know nothing. I know about two Bible verses and a hymn, a bit of poetry maybe, and that was me. I knew nothing, but I just announced to everybody, I'm a Christian, so get over it. But these guys prayed, and God moved. Now sometimes we think boldness means we need to psych ourselves up. You know, maybe put your ear, ears, your earphones on, and maybe put a bit of Eye of the Tiger on. If it's a man's song, girls, you know what I mean? You might want to put a, a rocky theme on, that's another fighting get going song. I was going to put some music on, you know, we're not going to take it, we're not going to take it, and get us all going. But it's not an Anway meeting where I've got to psych you all up. We talk about being bold, and boldness actually is a state of mind, not about whether we're geared up or not. We need to go. Peter and John kept praying, kept preaching. And they kept seeing miracles happen. They kept seeing people get saved. And the high priest and the religious leaders hated them. They were furious. So they were being told to stop it and they carry on. So then we jump into chapter 5, uh, 6. or we move on anyway to the next chapter. And the apostles are out preaching. And it says this. This is chapter Acts 5 now. So we're in 4, we're in 5 now. Uh, verse 18, it says... And they arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. So they've been arrested, they've been told to stop it, and they go, okay, and carry on. And this is defiance, isn't it? And then they say, Mecca's bold. So in the next chapter now, they're out preaching and they get arrested, and they, they arrest the apostles and put them in a public jail. And he said this, verse 19, but an angel of the Lord came by night and opened the gates of the jail and brought them out. Then they told them to go out into the temple and give the people the message of life. Whenever you ask for boldness or when you step out in boldness, you'll trigger three things. You'll three things generally might be more, but generally there's three things happen. Boldness always uh, has these three things running with it. Boldness will always trigger spiritual opposition. Now if you want to crazy Christians, you're gonna have opposition all the time. But if you're just going to step out in boldness, you're going to trigger spiritual opposition. It says they arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. This is the second time this week this has happened. I mean, imagine if I'd have been arrested twice and put in prison, would you want me to be your pastor? It doesn't look good on our YouTube channel, local pastor arrested. You know, film me from fa you know, Facebook, me in prison. Hi. In our country, we walk away from that in disgust. But in other countries, they wear that as a badge of honour. Somewhere along the line, we've missed it. But the apostles have been locked up. And this is the second time this week. And they, no, you could say, well, where's God in that? God was with them. You know, praying bold prayer or asking God to be pro will get people, many people, they may laugh at you. You know, stepping out in boldness, that people will laugh at you. You know, they may criticise you, they may talk bad about you or behind your back. They'll probably make fun of you, especially if you start living for Jesus. Anybody who wants to live a righteous life will, off, will suffer persecution, the Bible says. You know, many people are left alone, you're not invited to stuff. Start walking close to God and people cut you off. Christians shouldn't, but the world often does. You may miss out on opportunities. You may miss out on promotions. You may miss out on, on a job because you're honest and say, I'm a Christian. People at one point used to say, put the fact that you're a Christian on your CV. Nowadays they say, if you're a Christian, do not put it on your CV. I tell them up front, I always have done. That's just the way I am. If you, I've wrote this down. If you're not ready to face oppos opposition, for obedience to God, you're not ready to be used by God. I'll read that again. If you are not ready to face opposition for your obedience to God, you are not ready to be used by God. So the first thing boldness triggers is often uh, spiritual opposition. 
The second thing it often triggers is miracles. It says, uh, uh, have I got on the right page? Next verse. But an angel of the Lord came by night and opened the gates of the jail and brought them out. I love this. I love this because people make a real big deal about angels. And Luke's writing and he does this. But an angel of the Lord came by night, opened the prison uh, gates and let them out. Move on, move on. Now if I'm standing here and an angel appears on the platform, let me just say, take a picture. Let's put it out there. No, I'm not bothered. I've heard people say they've seen angels and seen this. That's fine. My dad saw one and I believe him because he was out there witnessing to people. And several people said to him, shut your mouth, else we're going to shut it. Now, my dad could fight, but he's witnessing. He didn't want to fight, but he could fight. And he carried on. And then this gang of people got bigger and said, if you don't shut up, we're going to shut you up. So my dad stood up and he looked across and he says there was a guy stood in the corner uh, he said he was about eight and a half, nine foot tall, and he just stood like a man. And he just looked at my dad and nodded and said, Carry on, we're here with you. And my dad just sat back down and said to these guys, You shut your faces, sit down, because it, you know, it was a raw Christian, and he witnessed to them. They found out who he was, and suddenly they shut their mouths and listened, because they didn't know who he was, and if they got into a fight, he'd probably kill them. But he was a Christian. So that's my dad's story, and I've never seen one myself, but I know other people have. Do be cautious of people that make a big deal about angels, because the Bible doesn't. It just says they are there to help you. They are there to encourage us and to stand with us. But the priority is Jesus. And be doubly cautious of anybody that tells you that they got saved by an angel witnessing to them. I say that because a lot of cults around the world are started with that. And there's nowhere in the New Testament of angel witness to anybody. In fact, every time you come across this, I'll talk to you online, they often say, go find this person who will tell you. Because angels, the Bible says, don't understand the good news of the gospel. They did in the Old Testament, and they will in the tribulation, seven years, three and a half tribulation, but the seven year out period. But in the church, they don't understand it. That's just a side note. But he says, an angel came and just opened the door. And they walked out. No big deal. Where are they? As you step out in boldness, that's when miracles start to happen. You know, Luke didn't make a big deal about it. He just carried on. It's as if he was saying, there's no surprise here. We expect it. And then just move on. The third thing is that it, boldness always requires faith. So you get opposition. Miracles will often happen, but it always takes faith. It says this, verse 20, Go to the temple and give the people this message. So the angel didn't say, I'm going to the temple to give the message. You go to the temple and give them the message of life. So at daybreak, the apostles entered the temple, as they were told, and immediately began to teach. They'd been locked up twice for doing the thing they were doing. Now I'd like to tell you, I would, I'd like to. These guys got threatened, they were arrested twice at this point, but threatened to be beaten or even killed. And following Jesus is risky. And I would like to tell you that Peter and John, you know, after these incidents in Acts, you know, John went off and got married, had a couple of kids and lived in the mountains at a nice house. And, you know, Peter, you know, him, him and his wife, they carried on a little bit, but because of everything, well, Peter and John started a business, made loads of money, and retired early. And it all went really nice for them. But it didn't. Obedience does not lead us into a comfy zone with God. It doesn't. Anybody in the Bible who's obedient to God, it always seems to lead to trouble. Encouraging you. Oh, do I really want to pray the be bold prayer then? Well, John... We, read, we tradition has it that he was arrested at some point and often beaten, but they tried to boil him in oil. But I don't know if that's true or just tradition. There's no evidence of it, but that's what tradition goes. But we do know that he was put on the island of Patmos, so that's where we get the book of Revelation for, which was a, de a, de um, a desolate island and just dumped on there to die. But he survived that and eventually came back to Ephesus as an old man. Um, so he didn't have an happy, go lucky life. He just had trouble and trouble and trouble for all being God. Peter, on the other hand, 
he didn't have a great life neither because he had trouble, trouble, trouble. And tradition has it that they arrested him and went to crucify him. And he asked if he could be crucified upside down because he didn't want to do it the way that his Lord did. Uh, there's more tradition on that than there is on John. But what we do know is that both John lived to an old age and Peter didn't. Do you know all the other disciples, Judas obviously killed himself, but all the other disciples were martyred. Jesus' brother was martyred. Most of the early church were martyred. The word witness in the Greek actually is martyr. So witnesses are martyrs. They possibly could die. So that's not all great fun and games, is it? So I'm asking you to say, Lord, let me bold. But I'm being honest with you. It may lead to trouble. It may lead to problems. It may lead to people having a go at you. But we need to keep in mind what Jesus has done for us. You see that song, I was a wretch. That's where we all were. People with no hope, no life, nothing. But in Jesus, he gave us life. He washed us in his blood. He cleansed us. He made us alive. He put our past behind us. He's forgiven all our sins. We can walk free. We have eternal life ahead of us. God will be with us. He will bless us. He will be there constantly with us. He will give us peace and joy. And he will help us to be kind and gracious and loving to people. That's all true. But the church is often the butt of the world. Because the world doesn't understand the church. In fact, the world hates the church, whether consciously or unconsciously. And we're in the kingdom of light. And if people are in the kingdom of darkness, they don't like it. But the truth is that the people who are in the kingdom of darkness are going to live forever like us who are in the kingdom of light. But they're not going to live in the same place. So our job is to bring reconciliation to the world, which means we go out into the world and we go talk to people. And if, like I said earlier, if we've got a sense of God's love for us, that love for us is where he loves the other people. And the other people are often ones hating us. And yet we should be reaching out to them. Make me bold, Lord. Is that a prayer that you want to say this week? It's up to you. But the next few weeks as we go through prayer, <coughs> make me bold. You can ask to be bold to say the prayers that's coming along. I'm just picking them out of the Bible. I'm only telling you what the Bible says. Make me bold, Lord. For some of you, I'm not expecting you to become Billy Graham and run into Halifax Town Centre and start preaching. For some of you, it might be taking a stand with your family. Some of you, it may be taking a stand in your workplace. Some of you, it may be a stand with your just friends. I'm not putting up with that anymore. I'm not doing that anymore. Some of you, it may be asking somebody, can I pray for you now in front of everybody? For others, it might be instead of asking somebody or inviting them to church, it may be a case of saying, you know what, next week I'm taking you to church. Instead of inviting them, I'll bring you to church. You're all at different stages. And I don't expect any of us, you know, if you want to run off in Halifax or so bridge, you know, go for it. But my challenge is, you know where you're at. And boldness is a step up into doing something that takes faith. If it don't take faith, it's not boldness. Boldness, you need faith to step out in. And if you say, well, I don't have faith, well, we need to be reminded that we've been given the measure of faith. And that if you've got faith as tiny as anything else, the smallest faith that you could have, you've still got some because you got saved. So you've got some faith, so step out in that. But do something this week. Ask for boldness and do something bold. Do something different. That's going to change somebody else's life in the name of Jesus. Amen.